Out of Cruel Space into a Wider Galaxy, Part 16. Harriet the Spy and HHHHH, Herbert's Hundred Harem. They were comparing their stories about the weirder infiltration missions they'd gone on since they last spoke when there's a knock on the door and it's quickly opened before either can say anything. Sir, ma'am, update to the latest mess, the Angla man says, leaning in and holding out a folder. Harriet's longer reach has her grab it. Good man, back to it, soldier, Herbert says as he hops off his chair. By the time the door is closed again, he's at Harriet's side and standing on his tiptoes to read it over her elbow. Well, shit, Harriet says as she sees the image of a gigantic slobe core with something clearly embedded in and infecting it. She reaches over to the flask and upends it to reveal the slightly larger than a pea piece of blood metal. A moment of compare and she curses again. Exactly what I was thinking. Where did she find it? Was it embedded deliberately? Some kind of experiment? Herbert notes, hang on, let me turn the page, Harriet tells him. She found it and is reaching out to us because the undaunted are one of the only powers she knows for a fact cannot be involved. All right, you just take a break. You got out of an infiltration like 10 minutes ago. Have a snack. Relax, I need to prep a response to this, Herbert says as he heads for the door. She follows. I'm no wilting flower. I know that spire have some infiltration experience there and friends as well. I can get you through the gang territories on the way down so we can help this poor woman, Harriet says, and Herbert nods. All right, then. You're heading the mission. I'm going to scrape up all the support you need. So what do you need? Herbert asks. Several doctors, at least one specializing in xenobiology with at bare minimum a professional understanding of slobe physiology. Several troopers that don't mind cleaning and then standing guard. A transmutation adept to repurpose local materials for a sterile operating room to get that thing out of there and with sufficient skill to produce null on demand. Finally, a lack of interference from centrist authorities. Harriet lists out and Herbert nods. Done. Get started on your plan of movement. I'll get it all ready, Herbert promises her as they power walk through intelligence. And then Herbert dashes away as he calls to two people and barks orders. For the briefest of moments, Harriet mentally compares him to a chihuahua, but then realizes it falls short as this chihuahua can and will tear chunks out of things many, many thousands of times its size. There's a lot of bark, yes, but the bite is exponentially worse. She shakes herself out of the half-second-long reverie and gets moving again. She needs to draw up plans, review her notes for the area, and plan a route all the way to the bottom of a spire, all the way down through nine levels where the gangs in power will be stopping the elevators to at least check the occupants, and more than a few of them are stupid enough to stick a gun into the face of a soldier. She normally doesn't bother with the stupidity and madness of a bottom ten. Generally, people that try hiding down there end up being shanked in the back alley by a bouncer after they tried to run out on the bill of whatever oiled-up man-thong lounge they had spent half a fucking day in and racking up a bill large enough that Tycan Ped's feathers would stand on end. She had tracked a fucker down there five times in varying different disguises to find that exact scenario had played out, and that's if they survived long enough to get to the dicky bar. There was a different way of going around down there, Every square inch was basically gang territory by default. If you walk around like your shit doesn't stink, then you're going to get it pushed in in the worst possible way. There is a silence that stretches through the last conversation. Learning that the games she had played had been loosely based on actual wars had disquieted All Lady a little. Look, the Wolfenstein games were massive exaggerations from the word go. You know how it is. Get enough time between a tragedy and someone looking to tell a story, and you're soon going to find something like a bunch of psychopaths who can't fall asleep unless it's to the screams of the innocent or some mad scientist with an obsession for switching body parts around, Jurgen says, and all lady lets out a huff of air. By the way, how hard is that to learn? How hard is what? She asks. Well, that's sigh. The air came out of your mouth, but you have no throat, no lungs. The part I'm addressing may as well be the tip of your finger or something. How long did it take to learn to mimic air respiration and air movement to that extent? Oh, that, all lady asked before laughing a little. Simple enough when you know how to talk, and I was butted off my father knowing how to make those noises. Not what they meant, but that's what's childhood's for. 
I see. So all slobes are born knowing how to manipulate their bodies, but now why they would want to? Well, we're born knowing how to keep ourselves alive and move, and smart enough to learn. However, finer control is something that comes later. A newly budded little slobe is adorable but can only make very vague shapes. Very rounded ones, too. But there are grand masters of the art, shifters so skilled, they can alter their color and put in so much detail that you have to touch them to tell they're a slobe. And of course, there are even rarer girls who can change their external texture. You need high-end scanners to tell they're not what they say they are. All Lady says before looking around at the cavern of blue slime that is her being. Old dreams, dead on the altar of reality. Says who? Jurgen asks. Common sense. Well, good thing it's not all that common now, isn't it? He asks in return, and she looks at him oddly. After all, it's common sense that a human over nine feet tall is suffering from terrible glandular disorders and lives a miserable life. She smirks after a bit. Oh, do you now? Oh, poor baby, she teases him. Oh, yes, poor, poor, oversized me. After all, one can only be larger than six feet tall if they're sick in some way. He says, and she laughs a touch. Jürgen, let her know we've already put together a team to come help her. She'll need to unblock the entrances if we're going to help, his handler says, and he pauses and thinks. Is something wrong? All lady asks. Well, you wanted to know if the undaunted reputation is deserved, right? He asks, and she nods. Well, they've already put together a team, and they're on their way. They request that you unblock the way in. What kind of team? She asks. Buddy, what kind of team? Jürgen asks his handler. Three doctors, five troopers, two with medical training and adept and an agent. Copy that. Miss All Lady, we have three doctors, five troopers with two of them medics, an adept and an agent inbound. An agent, highly skilled, highly informed, and often deployed in the field. Our agents are stealth operatives, mostly. If one's deployed, then they're likely trying to get the team to you with as little fuss as possible so nothing wrong happens. And they're coming now, but I haven't actually asked for any help, she protests and he shrugs. You clearly need it. Not to mention I heard my handler curse under his breath when we saw whatever it is that's in your core. No doubt it's something concerning. What was the first hint? That it embedded itself into me despite my merely examining it, or that it's caused me to bud thousands of times without ever successfully splitting? Wait, that thing embedded itself into you? I... I said too much. Ma'am, whatever that thing is, it has my handler so worried he's not volunteering the information at the first opportunity. Normally getting him to shut up is the trick. Right now, though, dead silence. We can't risk this information being intercepted, his handler states. And now he says it's so dangerous, he won't risk it being intercepted. So whatever happened to you is understood well enough by my people that we're basically scared of it and scrambling to do something about it right away. The more we know, the better we can help you, Jürgen says, and she stares at him before everything quivers. It, it was seven years ago, she says. I was just exploring the bottom ten. Being, well, being who I was then, I was basically slinging myself around along the ceiling. I can move in ways you solids can't. Stretch out, grab some thing, or suction up against it. Really easy, fast and fun. Then I bumped into something, something hidden. It seemed so harmless at first. A little dead drop place, whatever. Take a look into it. If it's bad, report it to someone, but leave it alone otherwise. It didn't work like that, though, did it? Jürgen asks. No, it was strange. It looked like a circuit board, but made of the strange metal. A bit of my gel ended up on one of the circuits as I was putting it back, and it wouldn't let go. Then it pulled, and before I could sever that bit, it was in me, and I fell. The impact knocked me out cold, and I don't know. It may have killed me. I woke up with two extra bumps, one of them badly damaged and with the metal inside. Do you think that... that I might not be me? She asked. Sometimes. It was I... The gel starts to shift before moving in a smooth flow. I am in control. I am the master of my fate. I am all. All is me. I am the lady that is all. The all lady. Jürgen finishes for her and she nods. Yes, I... Even now I am budding far too fast. And the bud is not going to break away. 
This is unnatural, wrong, and vile. It needs to stop, she says. Tell her help is on the way. They're at level 50 and closing fast. Help is coming. Level 50 and closing the distance, Jurgen promises. Okay, okay. This is faster than I expected. Or wanted, but it needs to happen at... What is this going to cost me? She asks. Just uncover the entrances. I highly doubt anyone will want anything more. You've been through enough, Jurgen says, and after a moment, he can hear things in the distance. Your teammates are reporting that the path out is clear now, his handler says. All right, then. Ready to go out and meet the doctors, Jurgen asks, reaching out his hand, and after a short while, a gel hand finds its way to his. The elevator stops prematurely and is forced open from the other side. Well, hello there. Now, what are you, little fish? A snicked woman begins to monologue as she forces the elevator door open and stops as she finds herself staring down a dozen high-powered weapons. Harriet reaches a hand out and pushes her back and out of the way of the door before pressing the closed door button. We're about to get another of those, aren't we, ma'am? Every fucking level down, the bottom ten of Shiona are a textbook no-man's land, and the reason for level one being off-limits is who we're out to help. This job sometimes, one of the doctors notes, the hell did you expect? Not an emergency surgery of an alien blob monster in the middle of gang territory, the doctor replies. Well, joke's on you. You came from Earth to keep soldiers alive and study aliens. Well, here's an exotic alien metal poisoning an alien woman. Let's work with it, Harriet states. I understand. I just don't like it, the doctor replies. Why the hell were you placed on this team? Because Dr. Ginn here has point-blank pulled of borderline miracles in the past. He just likes to complain, another doctor says, and Ginn turns to give him the stink eye. Of course I'm complaining. Do you have any idea what can go wrong? I do. It's horrifying. Not only is this a slobe, a species with one of the most dense physical forms there are, once you move past the falseness that is the gel they control. But not only that, this is a slobe that has been poisoned by the item we're extracting and may have created chemical or axiom imbalances in her system that could kill her when the substance is removed. Going cold turkey on anything hurts for a reason, people. To say nothing of the fact that the surgery chamber is going to be improvised and in the middle of potentially hostile territory, and the patient is enormous to such a degree that she is potentially the biggest member of her species to ever exist. And in addition, we are... We get it. Oh no, this last point is the most important, because we are going to be operating under the effects of null, which while harmless to the vast, vast majority of this group, will still have effects on you, Agent, and on the Titan that the patient is bonding with. And that's not even touching on the fact that slobes, which I remind you, is the species of the patient. That slobes have one of the fastest kill times in Null at three and a half minutes at absolute maximum, meaning we have 210 seconds at most to save this poor woman's life without taking it ourselves. More likely, we will only have 120 to keep her in the safe zone. Two minutes to operate. He rants before huffing a bit and then slicking his hair back again. So as you can imagine, I'm a little stressed. Backing out? Of course not. I don't trust anyone else to do this right the first time. I'm just making sure you're aware that no matter how easy I make this look that it is, in fact, very, very hard, Dr. Ginn says as he squares his shoulders and steals his expression. He, along with everyone else, then pull out their weapons as the elevator is stopped early again and this time there's not even a monologue as the Horshka gang that opened the door simply raise their eyebrows. And then one reaches in to press the door close button to send them on their way. Out of Cruel Space, Into a Wider Galaxy, Part 17. Harriet the Spy and HHHH, Herbert's Hundred Harem. Thankfully, after the first two levels, Harriet had a few code words to call out for the next ones that had the people trying to stop the elevator either leaving, turning their backs, or outright apologizing on the way down. As they arrive on the bottom, Harriet receives a text and smiles at the sight of it. Good news, people. They just tested their blood metal samples. The substance goes dormant when under null effects. Thank God, Dr. Ginn lets out a breath and everyone relaxes ever so slightly. The issue had been bubbling up but no one had been voicing it. 
Does its tensile strength change? Is it simply metal at that point, or does it begin to fall apart or liquefy? Hold on, Harriet asked, sending the message back. In a few moments, they have an answer. Substance becomes brittle, but retains the majority of its tensile strength. Can be easily broken by hand under null effect, even by a child. So that was personally from the big man, someone says, and there's some mild snorting at the nickname. Hey, uh, boss lady, Harriet turns to the trooper. Yes? When did you sign up? I didn't think any trets got so deep in as fast as you did. Full human here. No way. Ran into a continuum Nagasha woman. She thought I was sick and fixed me, Harriet says, hefting her substantial breasts. Downside is nothing fit for a while. Upside, every person and scanner they have are now easily fooled into thinking that I was just as surprised as the rest of them that humans were a thing. Go figure. Yeah, it was when I was transferred from admin into intelligence. Sir Philip just saw too good a chance to pass it up. Same with the shrimp, Harriet says. Huh, so why do we never really see you around? I spend 90% of my time infiltrating the insane and inane cults and conspiracies of centrists. When I'm on the ship, I'm grabbing more supplies, sleeping, or being debriefed. What about the other 10%? 2% is me on the actual ship. The rest is me goddamn relaxing after being 50 different people in so many hours and just getting my head straight with some good food and me time, Harriet says. Makes sense, so what can we expect? Level 1 of Shiona is mostly abandoned. There are numerous homeless people, but no gangs. All lady is literally too big to ignore and too strong to stop. As a power, she's very new to the area, but no one was able to stop her, and everyone dumb enough to attack her was either crammed into the elevator like a sardine in a tin, or thrown away so far and hard they left a stain where they landed. The only threat is All Lady herself. But she's... Well, no one knows how she's reacting to anything. The knowledge she's been literally impaled by blood metal and effectively always pregnant and mourning the loss of her own children puts a lot of the behavior into understandable territory. So why do we need troopers again? Men plan. Gods laugh. I really don't know, think Lady Basilash or Rakaxa want us to fail helping this poor woman. You know what I mean. Don't be stupid. Just trying to keep things calm. Cool it, he says, and she turns to regard the man. How about those homeless? Are they violent? They weren't to me, but I was alone then. No idea how they'll react to a large group let alone an armed one. She replies as the elevator dings as they reach the bottom floor. Come on, ladies, let's roll. I think you're the only girl here. Fine, then. Until the mission is over, you're my harem, if anyone asks. Harriet mocks them as the door opens and they're suddenly face to face with a small army of council soldiers that heard that. Hello, excuse us. We're on our way to deal with the big problem down here and Tiaria has been dealt with. Just head home for debriefing. What was that about a harem? It's called humor. Look it up. Excuse us. We have a mission. Harriet says leading her group out. Be ready with your weapons on the way up. The next nine levels are all gang territory, but are smart enough to back off from a massive shootout for no profit. How do you know this? I've scouted out a good chunk of this spire personally. Get going, and so long as none of you shoot first in a standoff, you can get to the top without anyone getting hurt, she says before pausing. And if someone on level six says their little brother is hurt and trapped under rubble, it's a con. And if you go out, you will be jumped if you leave the elevator. They won't damage the elevator? They need it, and no one wants to be in charge of calling for repairs or repairing it themselves. Harriet says, I'm sorry, who are you? Agent Harriet Dubois, Undaunted Intelligence Department. Anything more is going to need an NDA. Now, if you'll excuse us, we need to meet up with our missing man and more besides. What else more? Ask your employers and they'll ask Herbert. Now move. Harriet orders in the crowd parts. What happened to our target, Miss Tyria? In custody, please excuse me, Harriet says before a woman in power armor with a pointedly bent railgun steps in front of her. What happened? I blew my cover and restrained her before having her transported to a holding cell. The woman's been involved in more than our current concerns, and we were already taking a look at her for those other reasons. You were the secretary, but you... You don't look closely enough at the staff to begin with, 
and I can change my hair color and style in seconds with a wig. Couple that with a new outfit, some makeup and contact lenses, and I can be any Tret woman alive if I want to be, Harriet says easily. Now move, direct order. The woman in power armor stands aside as everything shifts further out, and the council forces turn to try and see what's going on. Several buildings break apart, and inside is an entire ocean of dark blue gel that parts to reveal an enormous man walking up a set of stairs from below. As he clears the building, it pulls itself back together, and a single door is opened behind him with a tendril emerging before bulging out to become the shape of a woman in dark blue. Jurgen walks up and snaps off a salute. Ma'am, good to see you all. How are we going to help this poor woman? First off, we need a preliminary examination of the injury. We need to know whether we're doing organ surgery, stitches, brain surgery, or something more, or all at once. That last one is most likely, all lady says plaintively. Have any of you worked with slopes before? We have. Each of us have. Dr. Ginn begins to answer before abruptly turning and glaring at the approaching council forces who freeze. Did you not hear what the commander said? Get back to your bases and await further orders. There is less than nothing you can help with, beyond making things more complicated. And while I may appreciate a challenge, doing so with a patient's life on the line is beyond the pale. Leave! They scramble towards the elevator, and Dr. Ginn looks towards Harriet. Tit. Honestly, I expected them to look to you for authority. Oh, this is the galaxy of daddy issues that could have anyway, Harriet says. I'm going to want the story from that. Jurgen notes. How about we get to examining the patient first? Dr. Ginn demands, and Jurgen puts his hands up as all lady titters. Lady, where's your damn core? The building behind them cracks open again, and he just stares. Are you fucking kidding me? You, adept. Lloyd. Adept. Come on. You are going to be making the holding platform for her core while she's nulled, so we're going to need you to know how to make one that's comfortable and properly supportive to prevent discomfort or harm, Dr. Ginn says, walking forwards. Comfort and support. Generally, that means a woman isn't pumping in enough axiom. Oh, trust me, without it, they're needed. I've got mine reinforced to the point it can stop bullets, Harriet says, and Jurgen mostly holds in a snort. I'm going to sit down before it goes off. I'm not sure if I can even stay standing without axiom at this height, Jurgen replies. What? But you're human and... Remember? Oversized humans lie in pain. It's called the square cube law. Twice the size is eight times the weight, Jurgen says, and all lady just stares at him. So, you're going to go through it with me. Not the getting cut itself, but can we please see the patient's core? Or am I using well wishes and prayers rather than scalpels and sutures? Dr. Ginn demands as he cuts off the moment with vicious prejudice. Right, yes. The sooner you begin, the sooner my life can... Well, I will never be the child I was before, but I will have more choice and opportunity in my life than the current madness. All Lady says in the broken open building bulges out in a torrent of dark blue gel. It pools at the feet of Dr. Ginn before bulging and then retracting somewhat until it's as thick around as an air car. Then the blue fades to transparent and his eyes widen at the sight of the cratered part of the woman's core. He pulls out a small and powerful flashlight out of his pocket and shines it directly onto the injury. Get a medical tent started. Adept, take your measurements. Doctors Howard and Lorne, I need your opinions. Dr. Ginn orders and people start moving. The soldiers start pulling out large amounts of material and being setting up a medical area as everyone starts moving. A tendril of all ladies examines her injury next to the doctors. Lady move to the side. I have questions and I need to be allowed to touch you. Do I have your permission? Awesome. Will it hurt? I don't know that that's why I need to touch you, Dr. Ginn says. After a few moments, the gel on the core pulls away and the entire crater is nearly dry. Ginn pulls out latex gloves and puts them on carefully after handing off his flashlight to Dr. Howard. Tell me if it hurts. Let nothing back and do not be shy. The more I know, the better I can help you. He then slowly, gently, and with incredible caution, puts his gloved hands over top the veins of darkness that have spread over her core, feeling it out before silently cursing. 
He pushes it ever so, and All Lady sucks in a pain breath, and he stops. The entire system had moved as one. So, the metal has gown. In all likelihood, we will need more than one operation to get this all out of you. But you can get it out? She asks. Yes, thankfully it seems to be going over areas dedicated primarily to digestion and not any nerve cluster. Meaning that this is quite literally not brain surgery. There will still be complications. We need to test how quickly the local axiom stabilizes after being nulled as well, Dr. Ginn says as he traces the veins of blood metal spreading over her. It feels... Yes? It feels like it's about to hurt. If you touch me any more firmly, I'm going to... She says and he nods. I understand. We have chemical anesthesia appropriate for slobe anatomy. I am trained in its full use. Dr. Ginn here is a master surgeon and neurologist and Dr. Lauren is an internist and hematologist, Dr. Howard states in the tendril of all lady nods. So, you an anesthesiologist, so this won't hurt. Ginn is the main surgeon, and Lauren is about complicated things. In blood? In essence, Dr. Howard says as Dr. Ginn continues gently feeling things out before all lady gasps in pain. There we go. Move the light a bit. The dimensions of the injury means I might be able to get a look, Dr. Ginn says, and Dr. Howard does so as he leans very close. Hmm, not good. Most of this nightmare is not on the more delicate organs and protrusions, but this part as well as this, this, and this. Very delicate. We will need to focus there first because it's where things are at their worst. If we stretch this out into several surgeries with recovery time between them, we should be able to have this handled in short order. That, that's good. However, there are issues. We don't know if you've grown dependent on this nightmare are possibly uniquely allergic to our anesthesia and have a very, very short window to operate each time. Not to mention there's also the fact that whatever this nightmare has done to you might be permanent. You could still wind up budding uncontrollably regardless of our efforts. I'm fine with that. Good, Gin says. Howard, give her a sample of the anesthesia for her to examine. Slobes can tell if something is bad for them and cut if off themselves and... Where is the medical tent already? Are you idiots trying to make my head explode over here? And you, adept. Work your woo-woo and make me a goddamn surgical bed for the poor woman. You're not here to look pretty, you hideous sad sack. Is he always like that? All lady asks. Only when he's awake. The man's extremely dedicated to his job and takes personal and deep offense at anything standing in his way of saving lives. You'll hate him, but he will save you, Dr. Lawrence says before pulling out a kit and uncapping a vial. Now, madam, I need a sample of your gel in order to make sure things are in good shape on that end before we put you under and pull out the tools. All lady pours a small amount of her gel into it and he caps it off with a smile. Thank you. I'll get started right away. You're going to get better. You got all this together so quickly, all lady says in wonder. That's the upside to being part of a team. Everyone pitches in, Jurgen notes. Out of Cruel Space, Into a Wider Galaxy, Part 18. Chech Ilish H., Herbert's Hundred Harem, and Harriet the Spy. All of you need to calm right down. What part of any of this joint operation is made better by people panicking and pointing fingers at each other? That's right, none. Now, the officers and soldiers that the suspects sent down to the bottom of Shiona Spire were not any further injured than the light battering to their equipment, right? Right? Well, that's good. Our people are all coming home safe and sound, Herbert announces as he tries to calm down the representatives. This clown show couldn't last much longer. There were just too many differing opinions on operating procedure, and everyone was too used to acting independently and with little overhead approval needed. Currently, the great debate was on who would get to keep Lady Tyria, despite the fact that it was an undaunted capture up and down, which stuck in his craw but he was here to play nice and not make enemies. Even if it was getting tempting, things do calm down a little, but not by much. The problem is that there's all sorts of differing standards of interrogation and detainment, and more than a few of them thought that unless a person was truly confirmed as a criminal, then they weren't allowed to be held in axiom scrambling cells, which was leading to some of the people around them debating on whether or not the assault on the forces sent to arrest her had actually counted as the woman was still insisting that she had been kidnapped by criminal forces 
and not in fact arrested by the legal authorities, which was what was muddling things up. Centris's insane culture of conspiracy and cult was truly turning against its caretakers in the here and now. He lets the debates continue for a bit before withdrawing an air horn from inside his jacket. The sudden sound gets everyone to jump and stare at him. If you please, he asks. We're arguing in circles and only about one of our many suspects. Now let's lay down some facts so we can start to agree on things, okay? There is general agreement. Wonderful. First off, while she may or may not have recognized our people as ours and therefore may have unknowingly resisted lawful arrest, can we all agree that she is a very capable woman that if provoked can prove dangerous to people and property? He asks and there is agreement. Wonderful. So I think that in such a scenario, it is entirely reasonable to keep them in a disarmed state and unable to consciously use Axiom. After all, it's not hurting her, beyond perhaps making her uncomfortable, which is a fair trade-off. After all, she has bent railguns out of location and forcibly moved people to a dangerous location without warning or consent, which constitutes a kidnapping. So she is a criminal and has been violent. So... It just seems kind of silly to me to debate this. There is a slightly embarrassed silence after this. Okay, then. Next big issue is how do we question someone like her, right? We have some people fighting back from being taken, but thankfully, she's the worst and will be the hardest to interrogate. Now, how? That question kicks up a din, and he raises an eyebrow and has to hop on his communicator to look up some of the terms they're using. All right, we have a total of five danger zones in this surgery. These are these four locations spread out over the entire affair and, of course, the initial point of infection. The initial infection point is within the Sharat, the Slobe equivalent of a digestive tract, not as deadly as the points of contact on the Chinora points, which is neural tissue, and therefore requiring a great deal of more care to cut away the absolute minimum amount of tissue required to remove this metal. Any questions? Dr. Ginn asks as he goes over the projection of all ladies' injury. How much less dangerous is the rest of it? All lady asks. If we get the source in these five points cleared, we can almost rip out the rest with our bare hands and cause a minimum of... Stop squirming, I said almost. And quite frankly, I'd stab anyone who tried to rip something out of a patient's body barehanded, Dr. Ginn says. Also, it's pronounced Charat and Chinura. All lady says after a moment and he gives her a look. Right, thank you because making sure we had the exact right names in the Sloeb equivalent of Latin was the important part of the presentation, Dr. Ginn says in a deeply unimpressed voice. Wait, how many Sloeb languages are there? Jurgen asks all lady as Dr. Ginn continues on his game plan, and the tendril of the giant woman next to him shivers into the full-body double. She's both listening to the point-by-point -point breakdown of the surgery she's about to get and giving him her attention. Hundreds. We were one of the more developed species when contact was made with us. We tend to build underground, and especially in hills or mountains. But we had at the time six major demographics, 243 separate nations, with nearly as many languages, and we were putting drones and probes on nearby planets. All Lady explains. Really? That's humanity's level. A few more languages and countries. But that's generally the same as us. Well, in our case, it was more tendency to build down instead of up hiding us and not being in the most dangerous part of the galaxy, All Lady says in an amused tone. Also, our first contact was a colony ship coming to settle on our home world, picking up the signals from the drones and probes. I bet that was awkward. Not at all. We built away from certain places because they would dry us out too quickly, even with technology. They landed the ship there safely quickly put up an embassy and a university to teach us, and things just worked from there. Neat. You ever been? Jurgen asks her as Dr. Ginn and Dr. Howard talk about proper dosages to all lady to maximize time to operate and minimize risk to her. Once I was only a few years old at the time, and my father and I were due to leave shortly afterwards. You use the same terms? Of course. Some slobes imprint as males, most as females. It's generally a hassle to be male in this galaxy. Too much interest, she states. Really? I hadn't noticed, he says, and she scoffs before backhanding him in the chest lightly. You left a piece behind. Sorry, nervous, she says, absorbing the slight clump of gel she left on him. It's okay. 
These men are working themselves into a frenzy to find out all the ways to help you. Your surgical bed is ready, and your core is already comfortable in it. It is comfortable, isn't it? Oh yeah, more than the way I sleep usually. Making a large amount of my gel to have much greater thickness than normal is always a sort of funny feeling. Wait, how do you sleep? There's an old swimming pool. I fill it with my denser gel and put my core in that. It floats and I slam shut all the doors and windows of the building and just relax, she says. You can fit all your gel into a single building? Well, it has a lot of folded space inside it. It's got the space of nearly half this level all on its own. So yes, I go in there and sleep. She says pointing into the distance and after a moment he snorts. What? Well, this whole level is kind of like your apartment, isn't it? You just pointed out where your bed is. He says cheekily and receives another smack in the chest even as she laughs. In the distance of building shifts. What was that? Some homeless women don't like my moving them around. I've tried to clear them out peacefully, but some people can't do things peacefully. Allura over there is one. Allura. Not everyone homeless is a victim of circumstance. Some people make awful choices, knowing their awful choices and go through with it anyways. Allura is one. I've tried to help her, but she doesn't want to be helped, doesn't trust anyone and doesn't like anyone M or, all lady says. Then why is she still here? She doesn't want to leave. She hasn't said why, but she just doesn't want to leave at all. She's also a bitch. All lady says and Jurgen chuckles. It's not funny. I'm trying to get the vast majority of my slime and gel all in one place. But without expanded space to help, it's going to screw with me hard, she says. What's the difference between the two? He asks and she considers. Well, generally viscosity. I have to keep myself much more compact in order to stop from spreading out too far. My, the sheer amount I can control and produce has expanded beyond almost anything, she says and he nods. So, how big can your whole being be once this is over? Jurgen asks and she considers. You know, I don't know. I've always compacted myself, looking for more room until I simply couldn't, she says. Couldn't? I came here to look for a back alley doctor to try and get things done then but they tried to use Axiom and everything went black. One moment they're reaching towards my core to take the damn thing out. The next I'm blocks away embedded in a tiny hole I just punched into the wall. The doctor now flees at the sight of me and rumors are starting. To make it worse the thing, the horrible, horrible thing embedded in me was growing and so was I, she says before giving out a shuddering sigh. I know it's secretive that you need to keep things quiet, but what is this thing, she asks. Do you know what blood metal is? A story, a plot point in horror novels or games. Some kind of metal made out of the pain and sorrow of people and a little bit of metal in their bodies. It's always about some terrible and awful knife or rail shot that turns its... No, it's not real. It is, and that's what you're impaled by. Not quite as bad as the games make them out to be, but not good, Jurgen says, and she freezes. You're going to get it out, right? Right, they're running a lot of tests even now. How? Blood metal is... Where did you get it? That big scan that happened not long ago. We found a giant stash of the stuff. Someone found a way to make a lot of it and make it easy. The who, how, and why, though. Jurgen shrugs. Then what are you doing down here? We were trying to arrest someone who might be connected. Thankfully, I've received word they've got her in custody, so... Jurgen shrugs. No real rush to force myself back up and get back to helping, which gave me enough time with you to learn just how much you need help. I see, she says. So you had a way out? He pulls off his recall beacon from his belt and holds it up for her to examine. Is there Proton in this? Yes, it's an emergency recall beacon. At any time, I can be brought back to the Dauntless. It also puts me in stasis when I get on the other side, just in case I'm missing some vital organs, Jurgen says as it's handed back to him. He clips it back onto his belt. Then all lady smirks. What? A piece of cloth hits Jurgen in the side of the head. Put a fucking shirt on if you're going to be near the patient you walking infection risk. Dr. Ginn hollers at him. Jurgen quickly checks what was thrown at him, and he looks towards Dr. Ginn to find him next to Harriet, who waves at him and all but confessing she's the one who provided the shirt. He pulls it on, sheer white with blue highlights and the undaunted logo on it. It's in his mammoth size, large enough for your average person to use as a blanket.
Oh, I like the view. All Lady teases him, and he quirks an eyebrow and then flexes so that his muscles bulge through this shirt clearly and cleanly. There we go. Just hold that pose. Ma. No, he says before relaxing. Oh, come on, please, she asks, and he shakes his head. Please. No. Please? Fine, he says before flexing again, and she laughs at him a bit before something is thrown into her form from a distance. She passes it through herself and then holds up the small bundle of coins to him. I'm not a stripper. Then why do you look like one? These are muscles about being strong and capable. Yes, they are muscles, she agrees, and he gives her the stink eye, causing her to laugh. Stop flirting with the patient, you towering twerker. Surgery in one minute, people. We're about to know the area. Everyone vulnerable to it, brace yourself, Dr. Gen calls out. Out of Cruel Space, Into a Wider Galaxy, Part 19. H. O. H. H. Herbert's Hundred Harem, and Harriet the Spy. All right, what exactly is going on down on the bottom of that spire? An enormous lopen woman demands of him, and he rolls his eyes. Which spire? I have all sorts of urban renewal efforts going off as we speak to try and do something about the seemingly omnipresent slums across Centris. Herbert asks as he tries to get more comfortable. They need some good results soon. Otherwise, this coalition is going to fall apart. Hell, it basically already is with undaunted forces moving on their own. Shiona Spire, where the troops were teleported to the bottom of, the undaunted person, the one impersonating a child, he went off with a local and now you have a full team down there. What is going on? She demands of him. It was someone begging for help that does not trust standard council forces, he says. However, due to our sheer newness in the galaxy, she determined that we could not possibly be responsible for her misery and beg for help. What you saw was a team of doctors heading down to try and heal the poor woman who has been suffering for years without reprieve. There must be more than that, she says. All right, the poor woman, a slobe, has a chunk of blood metal embedded in her. She stumbled onto one of the harvesting antenna the Darnaxian concurrence set up and discovered to her misfortune a terrible power of the wretched stuff. However, my people have found a way to suppress it although it's of little use beyond those such as humans. Null reduces it to nothing more than bare metal, brittle metal at that. So what are you doing? The poor woman has blood metal impaled into her core. Any axiom use is just feeding it. So we're turning off the axiom around her and getting it out of her. The questions from her can come later when she's not at risk of God knows what happening at any moment. So we're starting to learn more about what this mad metal can do. The Lopin says, yes, it can infest and torture a slow bee into endlessly budding, but being unable to actually split, forcing them to develop into a multi-slobe of immense size and complexity, Herbert says, and there's an uncomfortable sensation in the room. So any other questions or concerns? So what are you doing down there? The plan is a quick surgery to get that nightmare out of the woman using Null to stop it from doing anything at all while they pull it out. I don't know exactly what they're doing, but we have three specialists and two accredited assistants in addition to the bodyguards there and field commander. Wait, you're nulling the area? We're using null in an incredibly controlled manner to prevent blood metal from acting out as we extract it. Will it act out as you extract it? We don't know, but we do know null pacifies it. What has it done to her? We don't fully know yet. I'm sorry, ladies, but we're in another waiting time. We need to hear from the surgery and we need to hear from our prisoners before we make our next move. There's nothing more we can do than what we have already done. We need to wait, he says plainly. The null takes a full 32 seconds to fully dispel. Lloyd the adept states after testing things. However, there are some odd axiom flows in the area, so I'm going to say 40 seconds instead to be on the safe side. All right then, the plan has to be adjusted then, Dr. Ginn says before striking through a few instructions on his whiteboard. We will be doing this in at least two surgeries. Our first will be focused entirely on getting these delicate contact points and the source of this madness out. We prioritize, first the source, then the delicate points, and then the rest. If we have to take three surgeries to get it out, we will, but we are on a strict fucking timeline each time and I will not have any of you numb-fingered fools screwing this up. 
I want this surgical tent scanned again. I want it cleaned to the point of obsession, Dr. Howard says as Dr. Lauren goes over everything again as they prep for surgery. The very slight natural movements of all ladies' core and the almost unnatural stillness of the crater paint a very disquieting picture of her health. We are going to be operating on less time than before, 100 seconds per surgical attempt. Our first goal is the extraction for the source of blood metal, followed by the contact points on neural tissue. After that, we will extract the rest. We have a total of 300 seconds to work with over the three surgeries. I want a 10-second sound off every single 10 seconds, so we are absolutely sure how much time we have. Is this understood? Dr. Ginn says, as the tent is given one last final clean. Good. Now is the patient ready? I am ready, all lady says. Is everyone no vulnerable, safely seated or braced? Dr. Ginn presses. I am, Jurgen says from where he sits and Harriet nods from her seat. Very well then. Dr. Howard, knock her out. When she is fully passed out, we will begin the surgery, Dr. Ginn states, and Dr. Howard pulls out a sterilized needle that he fits to a syringe full of a transparent liquid. All right then, all lady, what I have here is a syringe full of anesthesia. There are several parts of your anatomy that will quickly absorb and distribute this medicine through your system. You will feel a slight pinch, and then you will feel everything fade. Do not fight it, please. Just relax. Dr. Howard says as he walks up to the vaguely egg cup shaped surgical bench and slowly runs his latex glove covered hand along a series of bumps. Are you ready? I am, all lady says and then lets out a slight gasp as he pushes in the needle and starts feeding in the chemical. That, it, all lady's gel begins losing consistency until she splashes down. In the distance, several things settle downwards with crunching sounds. Time to work. Induce null and start the count, Dr. Ginn orders. Null in three, two, one. Lloyd states and then makes a gripping motion and the lights flicker. The world shifts and Dr. Ginn begins by breaking the link between the central infection point and the rest with a pair of pliers. Dr. Lorne, pull this thing as gently as you can. He brings out his scalpel and carefully, delicately cuts away at the skin that is grasping onto the chunk of blood metal. The semi-transparent state of the slobe core works to his benefit as he notes the small branches of the foul stuff and begins delicately slicing a path out to leave nothing behind. Ten seconds, Lloyd states. Dr. Ginn takes his time to make sure that each little branch of the vile thing that had grown inward is accounted for. Twenty seconds. There is a snap as Dr. Lorne breaks off the head of the nightmare and continues to gently pull with his surgical pliers to keep things moving. 30 seconds. He shines his light into the wound and sees more blood metal casting a shadow, and before anything more can be done, the gentle pulling of Dr. Lorne breaks away the main portion of the blood metal. 40 seconds. Dr. Ginn gives out a slight grunt as he quickly switches things out for his surgical pliers and gently guides them through the wound and extracts a tiny shard of blood metal. 50 seconds. He quickly extracts another two and begins to examine the wound. He then takes a syringe full of a nutrient solution and pours it into the wound to encourage healing. 60 seconds. Nothing. It's clean, meaning he's ahead of schedule. He quickly trades out for the stronger pliers as he breaks the metal surrounding the compromised neural tissue and then trading for a scalpel again. 70 seconds. Slowly, gently, he doesn't cut the blood metal away. He begins to shave it. 80 seconds. He's halfway done. 90 seconds. He finishes and pulls away the delicate piece and quickly judges things before stepping back. First session is finished. Let the axiom back in. All right. Null effect is ended. 30 seconds until axiom is returned to normal. Lloyd finishes his count as Dr. Ginn sits down as the medics rush off with the tools to clean them, just in case they didn't bring enough. Thank goodness this is annoying, Jurgen says from nearby. Annoying, is it? Yes, annoying. The square cube law just hit me in the face like a hammer, Jurgen says as he slowly cracks his back. Mostly because I clearly have been ignoring far too many aches and pains thanks to Axiom, and without it, it felt like I fell down the stairs to this level. Stop whining. At least you don't have a pair of bowling balls strapped to your chest, 
Harriet mutters as she leans back in her chair for the first since the null induction. All right, so we take some time, let our patient relax and recover before putting her under again, Dr. Ginn says. Meanwhile, Dr. Lorne will... I know how to do my job, thank you. I will need newly produced slime from her core if we're going to understand whether she's going through a chemical crash or not, and we're not getting that for a few more moments, Dr. Lorne states. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get my tools ready. All lady returning to consciousness was not a slow affair. Fifteen minutes after her being first put under, and she was shifting again. Her gel pours off and then connects to the masses beyond, forming a link, and the whole area shifts and groans before moving back into place. Oh, oh, whoa, that was a sensation, all lady says. How are you feeling? Hurt? Stabbed? Wounded further? Slobe gel is the best substance to actually clean a slobe wound as it keeps you clean and helps with healing. I added a nutrient solution to speed up its production in that area. But are you in greater pain? I... She begins before forming a head around her crater, and he swats it away. Tell me what you feel, not what you see, Dr. Ginn orders. A tendril of gel forms a woman and shifts from side to side as she considers. There's still a lot of numbness. There is something different. A sensation of dread is gone, but how much is left? We got the source out, and one of the main danger areas, however, the vast majority of the injury is still in place. We will need at least two more surgeries to completely clear things away. When you feel ready, we will put you under again and begin the next session. Dr. Ginn says, pointing to the bowl where all the extracted pieces were. At his nod, all lady shifts around and examines it, but does not approach it. I hope you don't mind if we keep all the metal to test it. Throw these evil things at our scientists and see if something happens. By all means, if I never get in sight range of these horrors again, I'd be happy, she says, and Dr. Ginn nods. Now, when are you feeling ready for things? Let us know. We'll start again. Your hands are shaking. Side effect of adrenaline, Dr. Ginn says before patting at his doctor's coat, before sighing. Right. I left my smokes back on the ship. You smoke? My lungs to do what I will with. Considering Axiom, I was able to cough up all the side effects and move on, Dr. Ginn remarks before sighing. So the sooner we get to the next bit, the sooner I can get my smokes. Sir, we have some curious peoples taking a look at things, one of the soldiers states. If they get too close, then warn them off. Otherwise, leave them alone. The Null will drive them off on the next surgery, Harriet orders. Understood. The soldier states, Jürgen, get them to... Harriet begins before there's a shift, and her gaze turns to see a dark blue tendril emerge nearby. The onlookers inform an extension of all lady who speaks to them all. Whatever she says, it gets them all moving away, and the tendril is retracted. I'm ready for my second bit of surgery. The sooner all this madness is out of me, the better. A few more moments. I have one last test to give here. Dr. Lorne says as he studies the gel he's taken from All Lady's core. After a nearly silent minute, he nods. We're in the clear. For now. I give my approval for the next part of the surgery. Then, can we start again? All Lady asks. Yes, we can. Start a countdown, adept. Let the fools know we're about to null this place from Dr. Ginn orders. Out of cruel space into a wider galaxy, part 20. Harriet the Spy in H. H. Herbert's Hundred Harem. The sensation of null on her was never pleasant. Sure, with the axiom, her new shape was perky, bouncy, and looked like a supermodel's idea of a supermodel on Earth. But with null in effect, everything drooped painfully. She leaned on the table and heard Jürgen's deep breathing. Thirty seconds, Lloyd states as she watches the three doctors work. Jin may be in charge, but he's clearly not the only star of this show. With Dr. Lorne assisting him and Dr. Howard peeling off the larger chunks of blood metal, things are moving quickly. Half the nightmare is already off and being moved into containment. Continual cracking and snapping sounds as the thin metal is broken apart to be taken away piece by piece. Third neural area taken care of, Dr. Ginn says. Forty seconds, Lloyd says as Harriet shifts as the doctors start moving faster. We're ahead of schedule. One last piece of metal on neural tissue. Dr. Ginn says, no remaining metal in the tissue in this part of the crater, Dr. Howard says. His operating position is awkward as hell with Dr. Ginn and Dr. Lorne, 
as he has to reach over all ladies' core and stay out of the way of the more delicate part of the procedure. But he still has surgical training and can still safely peel the blood metal off and away from the poor woman. The medics are quickly rushing up and taking away all the blood metal while it's forced into dormancy and then right into a biohazard container. That is going to be sealed into a tritite and lead-lined case once they have it all. 50 seconds, Lloyd counts. Delicate part done. Let's get this shit off her, Dr. Ginn announces. All three doctors shift around and quickly start peeling the nightmare of the woman in 60 seconds. Blood metal clangs as it's thrown away and then shifted into containment in rapid order. Chunks the size of dinner plates are stacked up fast and efficiently. 70 seconds. They finish peeling off the metal and high-powered lights are shown on the core to see clean through it. Tiny slivers are located and pulled out. 80 seconds. They scan over the core again and then glance to each other before giving things a third scan. 90 seconds. We're clear. Let the axiom in. Patient is free of blood metal and can begin standard axiom restoration. Dr. Ginn says, she'll recover a little sooner as well. I adjusted the dosage after seeing her first sample of it. Dr. Howard says, as the lights that flickered out with the axiom scrambled start to slowly start glowing again. Waking up 15 minutes after surgery is fine, Dr. Ginn says. Since when is fine enough? We're looking for healthy, and the less drugs in a patient's system, the better. We add them as needed and no more. Otherwise, we can cause further damages. The addictive nature of anesthetics are well known among humans, and we are intensely toxin-resistant by compared to something like a slobe. The less I give to any patient, the better, Dr. Howard answers, and there are some noddings. So how much sooner will she wake up? Harriet asks as the pain slowly tapers off, as the axiom returns and breathing becomes something she can do without leaning forward and resting the boulders on something. Any minute now. It was hard to calculate the amount of anesthetic she would need in either surgery without knowing definitively how much of her anatomy is dedicated to digestion, neural tissue, sensory tissue, or other vital organs. Each one processes it differently, but all of them are linked together normally in a single sphere. But each bump is a partial sphere with any one of a number of differing organs inside it, and she has bumps on the bumps of her bumps bumps. Did you have to say that in rhythm? Dr. Ginn asks in a grumpy tone. Do you have to be a giant asshole? So that's a yes, then. Dr. Ginn concedes even as the gel starts to shift again. Already? Hmm. Too soon. I'll need to run the numbers again. Dr. Howard notes to himself. So is she safe to approach, or am I still an infection hazard? Jurgen asks as he looms over the surgical tent. You're fine. The girl just needs to let herself heal a little and she's fine. The benefit to working on a slobe is that their slime repels almost all known infectious agents. She's producing more and her injuries are covered. She will be fine, Dr. Lorne says. That's a relief. Now, Jurgen begins to say and then stops as the gel starts moving. Is, is it over? It feels like it's over, all lady asks without forming any tendrils holding herself still as if afraid. Hold on a moment. The last bit of blood metal is being sealed away, Harriet says before the final lock on the biohazard containment latches into place. Sealed, a medic reports. Good. Get that nightmare out of here and away from this poor woman. Harriet says even as all lady reconnects to her gel and things start moving. So it's over? I can use Axiom on myself again? Yes, Dr. Ginn says. There are no longer any traces of. The gel rushes around and then rushes onto the core only to vanish. Like an entire waterfall landing in a single shot glass and being unable to fill it. Then suddenly it does as dark blue gel surrounds the core. And then it seems to invert and a singular transparent and delicately detailed gel woman is lounging in the surgical bed. I haven't been able to be small and cute for years, she exclaims in a giddy tone. I can store all that gel again in my core. Oh, this is great. I'll be able to go up top, feel the sunlight, not starve as I feel myself bud over and over again without ever having a child. Oh, thank you. Thank you, little humans. This is everything I wished for but didn't dare think I would truly gain. All right, so the patient is recovering. I hope. How did you hide your core like that? Dr. Ginn asks. 
one of the earliest axiom techniques a slobe learns, one I couldn't use with that terrible stuff inside me. All lady says before she shifts around them, he, he, I just shifted my everything between two people standing near each other. It took one move. So I take it that you've gotten everything you've hoped for and more? Jürgen asks, and then in a single move, all lady launches herself onto him and wraps around his torso before rising up from it to hug him around the head. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you for bringing them. I was right to ask you for your help. This is amazing. I can finally leave this place. She then flits off him and shifts around the entire tent in moments. Oh, there's just so much to do now. I couldn't risk going anywhere if I couldn't hide more core as is proper, but now I can jump around as much as I want. Oh, thank you. All right, calm down, ma'am. If you can bring your core back for us to check, we need a final sample to make sure you're not growing addicted to the anesthesia or having grown dependent on the blood metal, Dr. Lawrence says an all lady flits back into the tent, engorges her form over the surgical bed, and suddenly her core is in it and she slips away from it ever so slightly. She pulls away all her gel and only a thin film covers it as the core, now much healthier, produces a little more. Dr. Lorne gently gathers some of the gel in a vial. Thank you. Stick around until I finish testing this, Dr. Lorne says, and he immediately begins testing. Tiaria looks up as the door to her cell opens, and she draws herself up to lambast whoever it is thinks any of this is even slightly acceptable, only to see a tiny figure pushing in a chair. They then rush out before she can question anything and returns to push in another, then repeats the pattern with a third. What is? She begins before he rushes out, before returning with a small trolley covered with treats and drinks that he drags in behind himself. Nearly there, he says before sticking his head out of the room. Miss Bleat, it's time. Bleat that, Tiaria says before a woman wearing the mask of the daughter walks in. Then out of the trolley, the child brings out a mask of the midwife he holds out to her. He then puts on a mask of the son as she takes the mask in confusion. Wait, what is... She freezes as she recognizes the woman. Told you, the little boy says as he pours a few drinks and then grabs a can of something cold and bright purple out of the trolley. He opens the can and it causes a strange sound before he drinks from it. So do you feel sorry, the woman in the daughter mask asks. What? I recognize you. It's still you. You push me so hard into giving my assets up, Miss Bleat says. I'm sorry. I have no idea what you're talking about. Tiaria says simply, Then why'd you look so funny when she first came in? The boy asks. I'm sorry. Who are you, young man? I can tell you're a young man. Truly young. Healing comas leave a certain trace and you only have a touch of it likely no more than enough to save your life from an accident. Enemy action, actually. The child notes as he takes a sip of his drink. We got you. Now we need the other. The other? She asks. Who wore the mother mask? The boy asks, and her eye twitches in memory. So you do know. That's wonderful now. I want my lawyers, she says. Your assets are being looked over. You've been very, very naughty, the boy says. Boy, who are you? She demands, and he taps his mask. You're no son of mine. You have no sons at all, Herbert says before pointing to Miss Bleat. Now don't you think you owe this lady an apology? Excuse me? She's been having a very hard time after you and your friend took everything from her. At least an apology would be nice, Herbert notes. <coughs> is this all about an apology? It's about a lot of things. An apology is just one of them, Herbert says. You're insane. Nope, Herbert retorts before snagging a cookie. Now you want to play nice or nasty? Because you've played pretty nasty so far. I have rights, and you have trampled on the rights of others. Do you want to be treated in the same way you've treated them? Herbert asks. Who are you? Agent Herbert Jameson of the Undaunted. You. By many standards, I am a child. However, I am also working with the Council and many of its powers and associates to get our hand on what the Darnaxian concurrence got up to because it is a world of trouble. Literally, the whole world has felt it and... Dead, Tyria mutters. Excuse me. She's dead. The woman in charge of it all. She's dead. We were planning on keeping Bleat there in the know, pay her back and everything, 
but the woman with all the codes and all the plans died to a stupid conspiracy that tainted the food supplies of her restaurant. One day things are fine, then she misses a call in, I go looking and I find out I missed her dying by six hours. She is deader than stone. Throw an engine into her corpse and all you get is dust because she is dead, cremated and done. The whole thing is finished. I lost all contact after that because there were no higher ups and there was no one else with any information. Dead. Gone. Wasted. Stupid. Finished. After everything she promised and planned and wheeled and dealed and scammed, she didn't have a single stupid backup, so the moment she had a stupid accident with her goddess damn Lonrack steak sauce being tainted, the whole thing fell apart. Tia Rea slumps back into her chair like a puppet with its strings cut. Panting, furious, exhausted emotionally, and looking down until a bottle is placed in her view. It's a personal favorite of hers. She tears out the stopper and downs it. What was her name? Mary Andia Lowbridge. She died of lulithi poisoning. Her favorite sauce has an identical taste, and she was dead in her seat. No one noticed until the waitress tried to get her attention far too late to help her. Just slumped down and done. I don't know what she was making. She said she stumbled onto something big from an old club and kept it to herself said there would be big money in it and no one would get hurt. She just needed someone to keep things safe, which was me, and some startup funds, which was bleed. Tiaria says, gesturing towards Gina, who's taken off her mask to just stare. So what was the big secret? If people are getting kidnapped over it and the council is taking interest, it must have been big. What was the score? What was Lowbridge's big promise? Blood metal, Herbert says. What? A very rare metal that can normally only be created by turning someone's own axiom against them. It tortures the person to death and produces a few milligrams of the stuff. What in the... She found a way to make more. A lot more. Set up a lot of systems to automate things so well that we have literally the largest stash of the stuff in the history of the galaxy now. The price is incalculable because blood metal is illegal to own due to its horrific manufacturing method. But if it could be produced safely, and in mass we could have named a price. Any price. No. You see, blood metal is dangerous unstudied and could do anything. Just looking at it makes anyone feel uneasy, and the method of its mass production has contributed to the horrible nature of the bottom ten levels of the spires. Even worse, we have found one more thing it can do, which is that it will stab itself into a slobe and torture them into budding uncontrollably, but render them unable to split causing them to grow without end. There's no telling what it would do to other races. It twists Axiom and draws it in two, eating it for lack of a better term. There could have been a lot of money in it for you, but it would have only been a matter of time until everything went wrong, Herbert says, and Tiaria just stares into the middle distance, seeming to age centuries and seconds before she sighs. So it was all just a waste of time? Even if it worked, it would have just made us public enemies, she asks, and he nods. She slumps down into her seat and throws the now empty bottle away. Thankfully, it's plastic and not glass. Otherwise, it would have shattered. So what now? We confirm things, and then we see from there. Her bear says, care for another drink? Yes, please. 